tell the truth or at least don't lie. And the reason for that is that that's a very good starting position to straighten out your life. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? Welcome, Mr. Jordan Peterson, to Framgångspodden, the Succed podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, how does it feel to be in Sweden? Um, brief. I'm only here till tonight. Uh, it's beautiful. I mean, we, we spent, Tammy and I, my wife and I, spent some time walking around this morning. We, we had only half an hour, but it's a spectacularly beautiful place, and it's a lovely day. And, and I'm coming back here twice in the next month, so I'll hope. I hope to be able to see some more of it. Okay. But it's great to be here, as far as I'm concerned. It's nice. amazing, actually. So, and I love European cities. They're so unbelievably beautiful. Mm. It, it's always, I can never, it's quite staggering to come here, always. Mm. So. When I was doing my research on you, I actually discovered that you and I are complete opposite in some ways. Uh oh. <laughs> I only eat plants. And you oh. <laughs> only eat dead animals. I see, I see. <laughs> Why, Mr. Peterson, do you only eat dead animals? Well, I seem to have some autoimmune sensitivities that make it difficult for me to eat almost anything. And so... Almost uh, anything? Yes. So, uh, at the moment, I just eat beef and salt and water and have been doing that for quite a long time. No vegetables at all? No. Nothing except those three things. So, and um, it's been very helpful to me in a variety of ways. So that's why. Not, it's not out of choice. Well, I suppose it is. Because I chose to do it rather than not to, but... But do you feel better with this diet? Yes, much better. Way better in all sorts of ways. Yeah. So. And um, uh, how come you had these uh, healthy issues earlier I, in your life? Yes. Yes, well, it, mostly it was a consequence of my daughter's struggle with a set of very serious autoimmune illnesses, which she got under control by radically restricting her diet. The, we, I eat the same way she eats, and I had some of the same problems that she did. And so once she had successfully dealt with them in a rather miraculous way, she suggested that I try it, and having seen what it did for her, I thought, well, I might as well run the experiment. And so I did, and it worked, and so I've continued. Uh, a very funny thing is, for 10 years ago, I um, got the Swedish hamburger record. I ate 20 Big Macs in one hour. <laughs> and it was, so that, and it was after, big after one hour. that you switched to plants? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more or three years ago, but yeah, I ate 20 big mice in one hour. So and that was the Swedish record? Yeah, I, don't think I think this was 18 before. 18, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some freak. Uh-huh. So what, what in the world compelled you to do that, apart from the thrill of attainment? I um, um, was growing up in uh, a city like uh, one hour from here mm -hmm. and the other guy that have had a Swedish record also came from the same city. I see, so, I see. And in, in that small city called Haninge, um, it's like the only thing that they are famous for. Oh. So, when I so you're going to take top place? Yeah, when I was growing up there, I was like, I want to be like Jordan Peterson, but in this small city and I want to be a legend. And if you want to be a legend, you have to eat many hamburgers. I see, I see. Well, congratulations <laughs> on having Thank you achieved very much. that. Has it's someone, not too complicated. Has someone demolished your record yet? Mm, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So Maybe you, if yeah. you have some time left. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be able but to eat buns. But you eat buns, much though. meat? Beef? Just beef. Yeah. Just beef, not like pure blood. You drink pure blood. No. 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 Only beef. Only beef. But do you have butter or no. some salt? No. Salt. Okay, salt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nice. That seems to work. Yeah. 
Pepper, not so well, but so. <laughs> okay. I have read your book, 12 Rules for Life, which is the best selling book in the world right now. Congrats. Thank you. If you were to choose one rule from your book, mm -hmm. which one would that be and why? Oh, it's probably uh, tell the truth or at least don't lie. And the reason for that is that that's a very good starting position to straighten out your life. It's really helpful to be careful about what you say and to not say things that you know are false. It Never. Or is it like sometimes? Never would be best. Never would be best. Yes. I mean, it's not a straightforward thing to do. And that doesn't mean you get to tell the truth to, as a weapon. That's not the truth. That's a partial truth masquerading as truth to use as a weapon. I mean, it, 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 you have to be sophisticated about it. But it's very useful to discipline yourself not to use your language in a manipulative manner. It doesn't work. It's a very, very bad medium to long-term strategy. And your life will become much simpler in a good way, much less anxiety provoking and much more exciting and adventurous if you just say what you think. Or even more importantly, don't say things you know to be untrue. One, one, one suggestion I have for people is that they listen to what they say and feel how it makes them feel physically. And what you'll see if you start to pay attention is that some things you say make you feel like you're standing on firm ground and other things that you say disconnect you and, and produce a feeling of disunity and weakness. And you might think, well, that's worth it because I'm manipulating the world in some particular way to get what I want and it'll probably work. It's like, it's not worth it. It won't work. It will kick back and you will be punished for it. So one of the things that I've learned as a clinical psychologist, which is actually quite a terrifying thing to learn, is that it's terrifying when I think of my own life. Um, I've never seen anyone get away with anything, ever. Okay. Everything you do that you know to be wrong will absolutely come back and haunt you, and usually in a magnified way. And so it's very useful to know that and to be terrified enough of that so that you become careful with what you say. It's, and so that's... And how is that possible? Well, I don't know if it's possible perfectly, but you can always chase an ever-receding goal. I mean, you can, you can certainly not lie. That's possible. Yes. I mean, the reason I used that formulation in the rule was because, well, you can't exactly tell the truth because you're ignorant. There's lots of things you don't know. You have your blind spots and your biases, even if you're trying to work against them. So telling the truth, that presupposes you know the truth. You can strive towards the truth. I don't think you can know it, but you can certainly know when you're about to say something that's patently untrue by your own definition. And you can certainly not do that. So, and that's an excellent place to start. It will, it will, if you do that for a number of years, your life will change radically and, and, and positively. Cool. If you had the power to change one major thing in the world, what would that one thing be? Oh, I, I think we probably covered that, is that I'm going around everywhere I can, suggesting to people, for example, that they adopt more responsibility and that they try to develop a vision for their life and that they try to tell the truth. And of all three of those things, the only idea really that competes with the truth as, as in terms of potency is the idea that you should strive to be positively predisposed towards being, towards existence, despite its fragility and suffering. So classically speaking, the two highest virtues are truth and love. And it's difficult to put one of those ahead of the other. Love means something like hoping, for, hoping and striving for, for the best for things, despite the fact that they're inadequate and damaged and, and perverse and often malevolent. And that's part of, say, love your enemies. Is Well, what do you want for your enemies? Well, you might say you want their defeat. Maybe you want their violent, painful defeat, but it's better to want their transformation. That's, that's, 
it's better in all regards to want that and to hope for that and to act towards them in a manner that might facilitate that. So, and that's part of that courageous attitude towards existence that would manifest itself in positive regard for, for living things, for, especially for people. So, truth in the service of love, that's, that's the right ethic. And it's hard to talk about those things, especially love, because the word has been weakened by misuse, which is why I offered the definition I offered. It's like, it's, a, it's an attitude of courage to want the best for life, because life is very cruel and harsh, and it's easy to become turned against it and bitter. And, and there are reasons for that, but it's not helpful. It's wrong, despite the fact that there are reasons for it. Bitterness is of no utility. So, even though, you know, I've met many people who've had very, very hard lives. And to see them become bitter is not a surprise. But there's no utility whatsoever in it. All it does is make it worse. So, grin and bear it, so to speak. And that's part of aiming upward. And it is an attitude of courage, a voluntary attitude of courage. And truth serves that goal best. So, how could it be otherwise? Mm. You know, you can think about, you have an option. You can either have reality on your side or against you. If you, if you, if you abide by the truth, then you have reality on your side. You have reality against you. It's like, you think you're going to come out ahead in that dispute? That's not, that's, well... You only think that if you've developed a certain amount of arrogance, which is also another very dangerous thing. I can get away with it. It's like, no, you can't. You are so outmatched by reality that there's no contest. So... I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about success. Uh, you have met many of the most uh, successful people on the planet. What makes the difference between people who can succeed and can't? Oh, there's a lot of differences. I mean, it, it takes a lot of rare traits, generally speaking, to, to push you in the direction of success. It also depends on what you mean by success. So well, we could do this two ways. We could go after classical success, which is the sort of thing that you're mm, talking about, yeah, perhaps. Uh, not, not like only money. It's like success when you feel happy and uh, have a good life. Well, lot, then, then there's lots of people who can, there's lots of people who attain that. I mean, but I can, think you but can, we can talk about that. success in their career and uh, mm -hmm. build companies and uh, be a big hawk star, or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, often you need a set of gifts, right, that are given to you at birth to be spectacularly successful at something, say, like sports. Um, then discipline, that's extraordinarily useful. Um, intelligence, that's very useful. Um, yeah. The marriage of those two, I mean, if you have two people who are equally intelligent and one works twice as hard as the other, then the one who works twice as hard is much more likely to be successful. Yeah. Creativity is another useful attribute. Um, reciprocity, the ability to reciprocate, that's unbelievably useful. Almost all the people I know who are successful have very broad, well-functioning social networks. So even if they don't know how to do something, they know someone who knows how to do it. And they've maintained their relationships with those All people right. and they've done it with integrity. So they're trusted. So they have a network of trusted people around them who are highly competent. And so there's an ethical, there's an ethical aspect to that because you don't gather a group of highly useful people around you to trade with unless they trust you. And so honesty is a huge part of it. And I mean, I've seen people go into companies that were failing very dramatically. Uh, competent people go in and with nothing other than their competence and their honesty turn the companies around completely and that's very interesting to to watch and I've consulted in situations where that's been the case so honesty is an honesty I think the only real natural resource apart from air is honesty it's the it's the basis for wealth because if two people treat each other honestly, they can take each other at their word and then they can cooperate. Otherwise, you know, like if I can't trust you, God only knows what you're up to. You're so complicated that we can't do something simple and straightforward 
and, and directed together because we're going to spend all of our time trying to figure out what in the world is going on and, and this is partly why so much poverty in the world is actually generated by corruption rather than an absolute lack of material of, of, well, an absolute lack of material corruption is a, is, is a force that produces poverty like nothing else so, honesty, integrity, and then all the things that you can be gifted with, intelligence, hard work, uh, the ability to how compete, emotional is, uh, stability. How important is hard work? Oh, very important, especially at the uppermost pinnacles of, of different careers. Because as you move up a, a hierarchy of competence, let's say, you surround yourself by people who are more and more like you, right? They have everything you have, right? And so, maybe... At the, at the utmost pinnacle, you need a combination of ten rare things and you better be firing you better be firing on all cylinders, on all ten dimensions because otherwise someone else will obtain the position so the higher up you go in whatever you do the more crucial it is that you do everything that you're doing right People get taken out. You know, you see people very frequently, mm. entertainers, for example, very, very talented people, and disciplined even, and, you know, and very they, social they too. Social, sure, exactly, and and they have a drinking problem, for example, or and they're done. They're done. It takes them out often when they're twenty-seven. Like, so um, those are all. But trustworthiness is a huge part of it. You know, to be able to take someone at their word. Millions of people uh, see you as a role model. Uh, what is uh, your key to success? Um, I think mostly it's it's my the attempts that I've made to um, say what I believe to be true. I mean, I have some talents. I would say I'm uh, I'm a I'm a very effective reader. I'm a very fast reader. Okay. And so I can process information especially verbal information, extremely rapidly. So that's been very helpful to me. And they also remember it? Um, in a strange way. Like, I don't... There's people organized the way they learn in very different ways. And I have a large theory of the world, let's say, that's fully articulated, not fully, well articulated. And when I learn things, I plug, I plug it in. I plug the pieces that I learn into it, and then I remember those things. Some people I've known, professors I've known, great professors, remember far more than I do. They remember the person, the name of the person who wrote the material. They remember the issue of the yeah. journal that it was was uh, published in. They have more of a library-like memory. I'm, I'm not like that. I I have a body of knowledge that I can slot things into, and that's one of the things that enables me to lecture extemporaneously because I have this large structure of knowledge that I can walk through in different ways and I'm constantly like rearranging human, it. And, like a human Google. Well, I suppose. Except, <laughs> except that it's, it's themed. It's more like a musical piece in some sense. Because mm. it has a structure. And, and so I'm tinkering with different parts of it and sometimes there are pieces that are radically revised. But it's more like a computer file system. That might be a way... You know, you have your own personal file system. And everything's related in some sense to everything else. And like I can remember, I don't know if this is common or not, but I don't know how many files I have on my computer. Maybe 250,000. I know where every one of them is. Okay. So, and it's because they're all thematically related. So, right. And, and it's the same with the body of knowledge that I've built. And so when I read something, I just add to what I already know. And then I know where all the information is. But I forget lots of what I read. Lots and lots of it. Majority of what I read. And what are your weaknesses then? Do you have any? Um, I'm not very mathematically intelligent, I would say. I mean, not too bad. I'm above, somewhat above average. But I've had students who are mathematically gifted and they're so much better at, at mathematical reasoning than me that we're not even in the same conceptual universe. So that's definitely a weakness. Um, so that's an intellectual weakness. Uh, I have a bit of a temper. Um, and that has its advantages, but it, but it has its disadvantages. I have suffered more with uh, mood control than might be optimal. So um, I've had that take me out for times in my career where I wasn't functioning as effectively as I could because my mood wasn't regulated well. 
You were uh, depressed? Yeah, yeah. Although that seems to have been treated quite well by this diet. So I think it was an inflammatory condition. There's lots of reasons for depression. So I think it was a side effect of an autoimmune disorder. Uh, but that took a very, very long time to figure out. And so there were times, many times in my career, where I wasn't operating with peak efficiency. Um, so, and that's made me more irritable and sometimes prone to, um, uh, well, perhaps prone to anger in ways that haven't been productive. Um, those are the primary weaknesses, let's say, that I've had to contend with. Ah, um, there's others. I mean, when I was a kid, I really liked to drink, so it took me a while to get that under control. Um, that, again, had its advantages and disadvantages, but as a long-term strategy, it wasn't a good one. Um, uh, what else? I'm, I'm prone to say yes to virtually everything. And so, because if something comes along and I'm interested in it, then I want to pursue it. It's a, that's a consequence of... And do you feel stressed up? Or is it... Well, if I'm on top of things, it's great, because it's a never-ending vista of opportunity. But if my mood tilts, then I have way, many, way too many things to do, and I'm sort of crushed under the weight of it. So, so that, that can be a disadvantage. And then um, it keeps me... I don't know, it's the downside of having an entrepreneurial temperament. You know, people think that creativity is an untrammeled benefit, but it's not, because it tangles you up in things, and those things can fail. And even if they don't, you have to keep them going once you're committed to them. And so I suppose I have a proclivity to be overcommitted. Now, I, I, I've been able to deal with that because I also play a game constantly with myself, which is I'm always trying to figure out how to do things in the maximally efficient manner. And so I can usually figure out how to do multiple things simultaneously in a way that addresses all of them. Can you and give some example? I'm recording all my lectures and I'm using them as the first draft for much of what I'm writing. And I do a different lecture every night so that I'm using the lectures as the grounds for, for much of what I'm going to be writing next. And so that way I... And for, and for blog posting and potentially for cool. newspaper articles and... And for the book and, as well. Yeah, and for the book, yeah. And, and so... And so um, I built this system called the self-authoring, uh, it's, it's on selfauthoring.com and it's a series of exercises that are designed to help people write an autobiography and to assess their personality faults and virtues and to make a plan for the future and it really works quite well. We've done a fair bit of empirical research validating it and uh, that forced me, I built a business out of that and that forced me to learn how to do sales and marketing and customer support and to, to learn to not program software, because I can't program, unfortunately, which is another weakness, but to design it. And, and so that's, that's another example of efficiency, I would say. Uh, I think we can listen to a short clip, a viral clip, the, there you talk about uh, Scandinavia. Uh oh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, men and women won't sort themselves into the same categories if you leave them alone to do it off their own accord. I've already seen that in Scandinavia. It's 20 to so, 1 female nurses to male, something like that. It might not be quite that extreme. And approximately the same male engineers to female engineers. And that's a consequence of the free choice of men and women in the societies that have gone farther than any other societies to make gender equality the purpose of the law. Those are ineradicable differences. You can eradicate them with tremendous social pressure and tyranny. But if you leave men and women to make their own choices, you will not get equal outcome. You said that we in Scandinavia has the most developed gender equality. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe that ratio of men and women differ here the most? Oh, because the, the data on that is crystal clear. As, as your societies become more egalitarian, the biological differences between men and women in temperament and interest magnify. It's the most, perhaps, it's not the most well-validated finding in the social sciences because that's probably the relationship between IQ and academic achievement, but it's probably number two or number three. It was being replicated three times in the last month. So, and the relationship is actually extremely large. There was a paper in Science that was just, and that's the best scientific journal in the world, by the way, that was just published last week showing that there's a massive positive relationship between the wealth and egalitarian nature of a country and the magnitude of difference in preference between men and women. So, and the reason for that seems to be that 
there are two reasons that men and women differ, let's say. One is cultural and one is biological. And when you flatten out the cultural differences, the biological differences maximize. So you're not going to make women and men more alike by making society more egalitarian. You're going to make them more different. And that's fine as far as I'm concerned. It means, because it might be that in an optimally structured society, people were free to choose what their temperament inclined them towards. It's conceivable that that would be better for them and better for everyone else. You know, now we might end up with some trouble, possibly, if we have um, occupations that become entirely dominated by one gender. You know, so, but, well, we'll see how the sorting takes place. That, that'll occur over the next 30 years, something like that. Well, it'll continue after that. But um, we'll solve those problems hypothetically as they come along. So. What are the main difference between men and women that can never be changed? Well, there's morphological differences, like physical differences, that, that are part and parcel of our genetic heritage. Obviously, genitalia would be one of them, and secondary sex characteristics, upper body strength. So men, on average, are much stronger in their upper body. Women have a bit of an edge in stamina. They have a bit of an edge in verbal ability. Men seem to have a slight edge in spatial ability, although that's somewhat debatable, but it looks, it looks, it looks relatively solid. Um, women are more enthusiastic, men are more assertive, that's extroversion. Women are higher in withdrawal and volatility, those are both aspects of trait neuroticism, which is the proclivity for negative emotion. So women experience more negative emotion than men, that kicks in at puberty. Um, and the difference isn't massive, but it's, it's, it's large enough to produce about a three-fold difference in the rates of depression and anxiety worldwide between men and women. Um, men are less agreeable, which is part of what accounts for the uh, 10 to 1 ratio of men to women who are incarcerated, because that's the best personality predictor of, of, of criminal behavior. Um, women are more aesthetically oriented and men are more interested in ideas, that's on the openness side. Um, men are more interested in things, on average, and women are more interested in people, and that's actually the largest psychological difference that we know of between men and women, and that's a major determinant of occupational choice. Okay. And so those are that's that's a good summary of the differences. IQ, there's there's not much difference, um, especially at the average. There's some indication that the IQ distribution for men might be flatter which means that there would be more men at the lower end and more men at the upper end. Okay. Now, there's some dispute about that, but I think the bulk of the evidence suggests that that might be the case. All right. And so, but why is the west of majority of crimes done by men? Men are more aggressive. They have most testosterone, is it? No, no, not necessarily. Although, although testosterone seems to have something to do with it. Testosterone is more associated with confidence and competence. They are more aggressive. But, well, high testosterone guys aren't necessarily more aggressive. I think it might be that badly socialized high testosterone guys are more aggressive in the antisocial yeah. way. But testosterone itself is more associated with dominance than with aggression. But why are men more aggressive than women? They're bigger, they're stronger. Those are things that work. Um, uh, the, the advantages to being dominant are more potent for men because women tend to choose men who are higher up in status hierarchies. So the, the well, I'll give you an example. Here, I can give you an example, and this is a good example. Um, this was discovered by psychologists working at McMaster University in, in Canada, Mac, uh, Martin and Daly, um, and they were looking at the relationship between inequality and crime. So in, in geographical areas where there's a lot of inequality, there's a lot more male criminality, and it's almost all within race, male criminality, and it's almost all a consequence of dominance dispute. So now women are selected, men are selected by women in part because of their status, and so men have a fair uh, bit of motivation to acquire status. And so here's a way of acquiring status in a high crime neighborhood, high inequality neighborhood in Chicago. Have a dominance dispute with someone from another gang. Okay, you're both armed. One of you dies. Okay, now, is it murder or is it self-defense? It's plea bargain to self-defense. You end up in prison for two years. You get out in less than 18 months. Your street credibility goes way up. The net 
positive consequence across time is, is the net consequence across a reasonable span of time, not your whole life, is positive. You attain status increase. So there's situations where aggression, even untrammeled aggression, puts you higher up in the mating hierarchy. So that's, that's one reason. So aggression, physical aggression, co physical competition, physically aggressive competition among women produces no net positive improvement in mating opportunity. So. All right. We do like this. We jump into the last uh, three questions in Swedish. Three sista frågor. Um, what is the best advice you have ever received in your life? Maybe from your wife. Well, I've received lots of good advice from my wife. Um, I think it's possible that it was advice from my father and he was very careful to insist that I didn't... Um, what's the right word? To keep the arrogance down, not to brag. And, and, and that was very good advice, I would say. So, What are the best tips for get a happier life? Um, decide what that would mean. It's not going to happen randomly. I talked about the future authoring program, so what it does is invite people. Okay, so here, here you want a better life? Here's a way to have it. Well, first of all, decide what better means for you. So, and so you have to have a discussion with yourself, as if you were someone you cared about. So now we decide, you're taking care of yourself. Three years down the road, you get to have what you want, but you have to figure out what it is. Okay, so, do you want an intimate relationship? And if so, what kind of relationship? How are you going to structure it? What about your family? Are you to, how are you going to get along with your siblings and your parents? Are you going to have kids? Is that going to be part of your life? What are you going to do for your career or your job? How are you going to educate yourself and, and keep your education updated? How are you going to resist the sort of temptations that take people down? How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? What are you going to do with your time outside of work that's productive and engaging? Imagine you could optimize all that. Okay, so then you need a vision. Okay, what would my life be like if I had that? And what would it look like? Well, then you have to make the right sacrifices to get there. You need to make a strategy. And so you lay out that strategy and then start to pursue it and, and, and progress incrementally, right? Little better tomorrow than you were yesterday. And compare yourself to yourself, which is rule four in my book. That'll work. You'll be in way better shape very, very rapidly. So, but you can't just wait around for happiness to appear. I mean, unless you define it and pursue it. I mean, things don't happen. Good things tend not to happen randomly, right? Things fall apart randomly. So you need a vision. You need a plan for the future. And you know, it, you, don't, you don't want to make it rigid and tyrannical. And you have to do it in negotiation with yourself. But it's unbelievably effective. So do that. That right. works. Very good advice. Uh, if you um, could, should, um, if you could recommend one book to everybody, and you can't say your own 12 rules for life, which one would you rec would you? Man's Search for Meaning is pretty good, Viktor Frankl. Man's it's Search Man's for Search Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning. Okay. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's not very long. It's pretty accessible. It's deep. It's, and it's, it's fundamentally accurate, I would say. It's a, it's a profound book. And, every, and everyone can read it, I think. So. What is it about? Um, the person who wrote it, Viktor Frankl, was a psychiatrist who spent time in Auschwitz. Hmm. And so it's a discussion about totalitarianism and meaning and personal responsibility. And it's brilliant. Very profound, meaningful, serious, uplifting book, even though it's very, very dark. It's a great book. It's, it's been, a, a, uh, it's been a, a best-selling book for decades because of that. And if uh, somebody that listens to this podcast wants to get in contact with you or follow you, which platform do you recommend? Twitter? No. No Twitter? Not Twitter. I would say YouTube. YouTube? Yeah. Or my, 
or my Instagram? Best, I, I do have an Instagram account. Um, people can follow that. I have a Facebook account. Um, but if you want to know more about what I'm thinking about, let's say, YouTube is by far the best. However, you could go to my website, which is jordanbpeterson.com, and it has my blog there, so you could read that. There's lots of lecture transcripts there as well as things that I've written. My podcast is there. That's another, and I put many of my YouTube lectures come up as podcasts. And so if you like podcasts better than YouTube videos, then that's a good platform. But the best portal, all things considered, is probably the website. But YouTube is really where I've mostly concentrated. And the website is? jordanbpeterson.com Nice. It's an honor to have you here, thank Mr. You. Jordan Peterson. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks again for the invitation. <laughs>